Good morning. In the last lecture, I told you about the remarkable conjecture by Eddington on August 24, 1920, about the transmutation of elements in the center of the sun and the stars, and how in 1938, Hans Bethe worked out the complete theory of uh, the transportation of hydrogen to helium, and he calculated the luminosity of the sun. He calculated, okay? And that agreed spectacularly well with uh, the observed luminosity of the sun. If, if you recall, we will come to that, today's story is about the verification of this theory of uh, Hans Bethe. And in order to verify that, you have to determine, uh, you have to uh, detect and uh, count the number of neutrinos from the sun here in your laboratory. And when they did that, they found that they didn't get enough neutrinos. So this started a problem 50 years ago, exactly 50 years ago, and it took almost 50 years to solve this. In my considered opinion, this is one of the most remarkable detective stories in science. And it is this story that I would like to tell you about today. In 1937, Enrico Fermi gave the theory of beta decay and radioactivity. A, a proton inside the nucleus emits a positron and converts itself to a neutron or the other way around. Now this experimental fact concerning this beta decay was the following. If you plot the number of electrons that you receive as a function of energy, you got a continuous spectrum with a maximum energy. This is not what you got in alpha decay. In alpha decay, you say the nucleus is in some level A, and it jumps to some other level B, emits an alpha particle, then the energy of the alpha particle was precisely equal to the energy level difference inside the nucleus. That was clearly not the case, because if it was the case, then you should find uh, uh, electrons of only one particular energy, which was not the case. Now, this puzzled everyone, and uh, it seemed to violate the conservation of energy and momentum. And believe it or not, no less a person than Niels Bohr actively advocated that perhaps in quantum theory, energy is not conserved. Now, Pauli was a very young man at that time. In 1930, made a desperate suggestion, 1933, made a desperate, uh, 1930, made a desperate suggestion that this situation can be salvaged if a third particle is also emitted, a third particle which you cannot detect. And Pauli knew that that particle had to be neutral, it had to have very nearly zero mass, and it had to have spin one-half times Planck's constant. Pauli called it the neutron because it was electrically neutral. In 1932, Chadwick discovered the heavy neutron. Chadwick was another student of Rutherford, and they were making a series of epoch-making discoveries. And it became very clear instantly that this neutral particle that Chadwick had detected couldn't be the neutral particle Pauli had conjectured, because this particle had a mass very nearly equal to the mass of the proton. In 1933, Fermi, when he gave the theory of beta decay, one of the greatest achievements of theoretical physics in the last century, christened Pauli's particle as neutrino. In Italian, it means the little neutron. 
And the neutrino was detected only in 1956. So there was a long gap between 1930 when Pauli conjectured the neutrino and it was finally detected in 1956. Now let's go back to Fermi's theory of beta decay. What Fermi said was, it was a truly revolutionary statement at that time, is that the neutron inside the nucleus spontaneously decays to a proton, produces an electron and a neutrino. And one of his students, Giancarlo Wick, worked out the theory for the reverse reaction, which we today call inverse beta decay, where a proton inside the nucleus decays to a neutron plus a positron plus a neutrino. Of course, today we know that neutrino and its antiparticle are not one and the same. And for conservation of lepton number, because you have a light particle here, you should have an anti-light particle here. And because you have an anti light particle here already, this must be just a light particle. So this has to be a neutrino, this has to be an anti-neutrino, but Fermi didn't know about it. This picture became clear only in the 1960s, okay, long after that. Now, first, as I said, there was a neutrino associated with the electron. And this we will now call the electron neutrino and its antiparticle. In other words, I should put a subscript E here and a subscript E here to indicate that this neutrino and its antiparticle were produced in the context in which electron and anti-electron were produced. Now, besides the electron, there are two other light particles, leptons, the mu meson, which was actually predicted by Homi Baba for the first time before its discovery, and then the tau meson. So there are three light particles today, and there are three neutrinos and corresponding antineutrinos associated with all these leptons. Therefore, the total number of neutrinos are actually six, the electron neutrino and its antiparticle, the muon neutrino and its antiparticle, and the tau neutrino and its antiparticle. So we are dealing with six particles. But only electron neutrinos are produced in the sun because it is produced in reaction where a proton decays or a neutron decays. So remember that. So in our story today, we are talking only of electron neutrinos. <clears throat> now, it was figured out quite early on that these neutrinos, that's the reason why it took uh, almost 30 years to find them, interact very weakly with matter. Rudolf Piles and Hans Bethe worked out that the cross-section for neutrino scattering is of the order of 10 to the power minus 44 square centimeter, incredibly small. In other words, the mean free path of the, photo, of the neutrino of some typical energy is of the order of 2 times 10 to the power 20 centimeter divided by the density of the matter. So if you had lead, the mean free path of neutrino will be 100 light years. Okay. So the distance to the nearest star is about 4 light years. So the neutrino um, hardly interacts with matter. And today's lecture is about detecting these neutrinos that are supposed to be produced by the sun, if Eddington and Hans Bethe are correct. All right, now let's quickly recall what I said last time. Hans Bethe, in his paper of 1938, worked out the proton-proton chain reaction. And as I, I indicated, there is another route to formation of helium, that is the carbon-nitrogen-oxygen cycle. We did not discuss it. This idea was first suggested by the German physicist on Weizsäcker, but it was worked out in detail by Hans Bethe uh, in 1939. But we will not get into that now. This is just for the sake of completeness I am mentioning. What is it we discussed last time? The first step towards formation of helium-4 is that the two protons combine to form a deuteron 
a positron and a neutrino. I argued that this is an extremely unlikely process governed by weak interaction, and the reaction rate is such a reaction will happen once in about 10 billion years. But we said 10 billion years is 10 to the power 17 seconds, but that is a very small number compared to 10 to the power 57 particles in the sun, so this reaction will take place, otherwise the sun wouldn't be shining. The next step was rather simple. The deuterium combines with the proton to form helium-3. And then the next step was even simpler, two helium-3 nuclei combining to form a helium-4 nuclei, and you get back your two protons. So what I want you to appreciate is that in that chain, the neutrino, the electron neutrino is produced when two protons combine to form a deuteron because one proton has decayed to a neutron plus a positron plus an electron neutrino, right? Here only a gamma ray is produced. Here no gamma ray is produced. Now, this reaction which we discussed last time accounts for 85% of the energy production in the sun. There is another branch which contributes roughly 15%. We will not go into that, but I won't merely want to draw your attention to the fact that there is a reaction here where beryllium-7 combines with an electron to produce lithium-7 and produce an electron neutrino. Similarly, there is an even less probable channel in which boron-8 decays to beryllium-8 produces a neutrino. So, there are three chemical reactions in the center of the sun that produce electron neutrino, but the most important is the proton-proton chain reaction, which produces 85% of the neutrinos. How do we know all this is true? If protons are indeed being fused to form helium, the only witnesses to that are gamma rays, positrons, and electron neutrinos. Now, if Hans Bethe's theory is true, that the sun shines because it is converting hydrogen into helium, then the sun must be emitting 10 to the power 38 electron neutrinos per second. And a fraction of them is going through you right now. About 10 to the power 15 neutrinos are going through you every second. Now, what happens to the gamma rays? They don't come out, they get degraded, and they do a random walk for 30,000 years, and they come out as visible light. So they cannot tell you any story. All the memory has been erased. As for the positrons, they will quickly annihilate with the electrons in the uh, nucleus of the star and produce gamma rays and heat. The neutrinos escape, but they are hostile witnesses. It's like these witnesses. Somebody runs over sleeping people on the footpath of Bombay, and then they finally get these witnesses. After 10 years, when the case goes for trial, they will say, no, 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 I didn't see anything. So neutrinos are like this. It's going to be very difficult to catch them. And then when you catch them, they have to have the right energy and the right number before you can say Eddington and Hans Bethe were right. So the story began when I was a young student like you, when John Bacall, a young physicist in Princeton, collaborated with Raymond Davis, a distinguished experimental chemist. And Davis said, look, I know how to find these neutrinos. And Bacall said, look, I know how to calculate how many neutrinos should come and how they will interact with your detector. So they struck up a collaboration. Now, this was the experiment. Davis got himself, first of all, he found an underground mine in Homestake Gold Mine in the United States, one kilometer underground. And he got himself a huge tank, which consisted of 100,000 gallons of carbon tetrachloride. So when you give your sari or suit to the dry cleaner, this is what the dry cleaner uses, carbon tetrachloride, okay? 
And I have used this as a student to study Raman spectra. When you're an MSc student, when you do Raman spectroscopy in your lab, this is the liquid that one uses. How did Raymond Davis propose to find the electron solar neutrinos using this 100,000 gallons of uh, carbon tetrachloride? Now, listen to this. Here is the reaction. A neutrino from the sun is interacts with the chlorine 37 inside the tank, produces argon 37. So the name of the game, argon 37 is a radioactive nucleus. The name of the game is to go around in this tank and find these argon 37 nuclei and count them. Each time you find one, you can say one neutrino has interacted in my giant tank. What are we talking about? Every few months, Raymond Davis collected 15 organ atoms in a tank containing 10 to the power 30 atoms. Yeah, sounds like science fiction, right? So everything I'm going to say today will appear to you to be science fiction, but that's what science is all about, making this fiction become a reality. So this is an incredible technical feat. Please remember, in a few months, huh, every few months, you get about 15 atoms. All right, now, what sort of neutrinos is this experiment sensitive to? What I have plotted here is the neutrino flux at Earth, number of neutrinos per unit area per unit time, as a function of the neutrino energy. So you find the proton-proton chain reaction neutrinos are over here. The important thing to appreciate is that's where all the neutrinos are, 85% of them, and they're all a very low energy, less than 0.3 MeV. The other thing, the beryllium-7 and boron-8 uh, neutrinos are smaller in number, but they're also of higher energy. The chlorine detector of Raymond Davis could only detect the high-energy neutrinos. So it was a losing battle from the beginning. You can only detect the high-energy neutrinos, and there are only very few high-energy neutrinos. Most of the neutrinos are very low energy. So here is uh, um, uh, details of this, but I would not dwell on this. I merely want you to appreciate that this chlorine experiment of Raymond Davis is sensitive only to high-energy neutrinos. But you know how many there ought to be. Okay, Hans Wethe's theory tells you all that. Therefore, Raymond Davis's experiment is only sensitive to the neutrinos that are produced in that reaction, beryllium-7 reaction and boron-8 reaction. These are um, not as many as neutrinos produced in that reaction. All right. I remember as a student in the University of Chicago, one Thursday afternoon, a colloquium, Raymond Davis coming and giving the first preliminary results of this experiment. I remember it as though it was yesterday. The results are expressed in terms of units which are called SNU, solar neutrino units. One solar neutrino unit is 10 to the power minus 36 neutrinos per second. So the unit itself tells you how improbable the detection of neutrinos is going to be. All right? Now the threshold for neutrinos in this, excuse me, neutrinos is 0.8 MeV. In other words, it can only detect neutrinos with energy greater than approximately 1 MeV. The proton-proton reaction neutrinos cannot be detected. All right, what is the predicted rate according to theoretical physics? The predicted rate was 7.9, 1 plus or minus 0.33 solar neutrino units. So in other words, the next digit, 7.91, and the error is plus or minus 0 0.33. That's what nuclear physics predicts. And what did Davis find? 
there is found 2.1 plus or minus 0.9 SNU. This is the time to open your champagne bottles and have a big party. He has detected solar neutrinos. But that was not what Raymond Davis said in the colloquium which I attended in 1968. He was absolutely downcast because he said, look, I only detected one third of the neutrinos. Of course, everybody would have laughed because don't be silly. The errors in your experiment must be so large, you should thank God that you detected any neutrinos in the first place, right? But Raymond Davis was a very good experimental chemist. He said, no, I know exactly what I'm doing, and I can tell you there are only one third argon atoms compared to what was actually predicted. This is the solar neutrino puzzle. And that was 1968, and the puzzle only got solved fully around 2011. All right, what was wrong? Many things could have been wrong. Perhaps the theoretical calculations were wrong. This may be either due to predicted number of neutrinos being wrong, or Hans Bethe might have been correct, but your production rate of argon atoms in the, water, in the uh, tank could be wrong. So there are two counts on which you could be wrong. The other possibility is, perhaps the experiment was wrong. The other possibility is, everything is right, but maybe something is wrong with fundamental physics. It's a very modest statement, right? Okay, first, there was a neutrino associated with the electron, the electron neutrino. Then came the mu meson and the tau meson. Then came the neutrinos associated with the mu meson and tau meson. But the sun produces only the electron neutrinos. This is a slide I've shown before. The reason I showed it again is at this stage, a former colleague of Enrico Fermi, Bruno Ponticarvo, who by the time had gone to Russia and settled in Russia, made an extraordinary statement. He said, no, 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 there is nothing wrong with Davis's experiment. It is just that the neutrino suffered from a personality disorder. Something happened on the way to the Earth. Right? Because when somebody says something like this, you just don't take any note of it, right? So that's what <laughs> most physicists said. Uh, some crazy guy uh, throwing out some crazy idea. So Ponte Corvo was a very clever and a very serious physicist. Now let's try to understand what he actually said. Recall, only electron neutrinos are produced in the fusion reactions in the sun. Ponte Corvo and Gribov, a Russian colleague at that stage, made the radical suggestion that as the electron neutrinos journeyed to the Earth from the center of the sun, they periodically changed their identity between three flavors. Electron neutrino became muon neutrino, became tau neutrino, became muon neutrino, became, and it goes on and on and on. That is, their flavor as it is called, oscillated between these three possibilities. Why it should oscillate is a different matter, right? So when they arrived at the Earth, they are a mixture of three types of neutrinos, but Davis's experiment can detect only one type of neutrino, and that's why he detected only one third of the neutrino, right? So, you, 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 hundred people are invited to a party, and they are told you have to wear red clothes to, uh, the bouncer won't let you in unless you wear red clothes. On the way to the party, you change to blue clothes and green clothes and back to red and blue and green. So obviously, the number of people who will be admitted will be only one third of the number of people who set out to go to the party, right? So that's the suggestion made by Ponte Carvo and um, Gribov. No one took 
Monte Carlo's suggestion very seriously. The suspects continue to be the theoretical predictions of the number of neutrinos produced in the sun could be wrong. Theoretical calculations of the rate of detection in the chlorine detector could be wrong. And there could be large experimental errors that Davis hadn't properly taken into account. Now, John Bacall was a very persuasive young man and terribly clever, persuaded hundreds of others in many countries around the world to undertake these theoretical calculations all over again to make sure that the theory, theoretical prediction was on the sound footing. And they could not find anything wrong. Davis said, 1968, that is when I first heard the result, continued with this experiment for 20 years. And here is his data. The average number of neutrinos he detects is 0.5 in some units. The theoretical prediction is it should be 1.5 in some units. So allowing for the large errors in the experiment, very clearly this discrepancy is significant after 20 years of continuous experimentation. All right. So people began to take Raymond Davis seriously that something is wrong. Then somebody remembered, ah, but Raymond Davis's experiment can only detect the high energy neutrinos. There are only very few of them. Let's try to go and detect the low energy neutrinos and see what answer we get. So new experiments were planned to detect low energy as well as the high energy neutrinos. So the experiments that were planned use gallium as a detector, not chlorine as a detector. Now the gallium detector was sensitive to the proton-proton neutrinos, and there is a large number of them there. Remember, this is a logarithmic plot. Okay. How does this work? The neutrino is absorbed by gallium-71, and it produces germanium-71, and that is unstable and decays back. The important thing is the threshold energy for this reaction is rather low energy, 0.2 MeV, whereas for the chlorine experiment, it was about 1 MeV. So this gallium detector could detect the low energy neutrinos. But you need a lot of gallium, so people gathered all the gallium that was in the world, and there were two experiments. One, okay, so I've explained this. Um, there were two experiments. One of them was called Galax, the other one was called Sage. The Galax experiment used 30 tons of gallium in an aqueous solution and was located in the Gran Sasso tunnel in the Alps mountains bordering Italy and Switzerland. Then an American uh, Soviet, those days not Russian, gallium experiment said use 60 tons of gallium, and this was in the Basque, in the Caucasus mountains. What did they find? The surprising result of these much awaited experiments was that a substantial number of low energy neutrinos were also missing. This clearly deepened the mystery. People had hoped that maybe this time you'll find all the neutrinos. So at that time, the Japanese said, we will try water as a detector. You can get lots of water. Right? Cheap. What is the principle of that? The principle is a neutrino scatters off an electron and accelerates the electron to relativistic speeds. And the electron emits radiation in a forward cone, which is known as Cherenkov radiation. Now, I'm sure all of you have read about Cherenkov radiation. If you have not, Cherenkov radiation is the analog of shock waves in sound, which occur when you exceed the speed of sound. So Cherenkov radiation is the radiation emitted by a charged particle. If its phase velocity in a certain medium exceeds the speed of light, in that medium. And the characteristic thing about Cherenkov radiation 
is that it is emitted in the forward direction in a very narrow cone. And the name of the game is to detect this Cherenkov photon. Now, the important thing and a very nice thing about this water experiment is that this electron doesn't care which kind of neutrino it was. So, in principle, this detector can detect not only the electron neutrino, but the muon neutrino as well as the tau neutrino. And the reaction we are talking about is this. Now, the neutrino electron scattering will occur for all flavors, as I said, but it is most sensitive for electron neutrinos and less sensitive for muon and tau neutrino. To be precise, if I remember correctly, it is 6.5 times more sensitive in detecting electron neutrinos than muon or tau neutrino. But in principle, it can detect the other two flavors of neutrinos also. The beautiful thing about this uh, Japanese experiment was that one can reconstruct the direction in which the incident neutrino came. The neutrino, the electron is scattered more or less in the forward direction. The Cherenkov photon is in the forward direction. So if I look, I'm looking at the source of the neutrino. Then the scattering experiments also provide the exact arrival time of the neutrinos. It is not relevant for the sun because the sun is radiating all the time, doesn't have any holidays. But there are other situations where the neutrinos is emitted only at a certain time. For example, when a star explodes. So this experiment would then be able to tell, did I get the neutrinos at the same time as the astronomers say the star has exploded? So this experiment in principle has this. And in fact, on the 23rd of February 1987, a star did explode in the nearest galaxy, the large Magellanic Cloud. It was seen by a car mechanic in New Zealand who was an amateur astronomer, and he alerted the astronomers all over the world, and there was a supernova explosion, and this experiment in Japan detected the burst of neutrinos. We'll come to that story again next week, and for which uh, the principal experimentalist was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics, in fact. Now, this experiment, which I'm referring to, was done in a place called Kamio Kande, and I'm referring to Kamio Kande 2 experiment. It's located one kilometer underground. It's a cylindrical tank, 16 meters in diameter and 16 meters in height. It could accommodate 3,000 metric tons of water, ordinary water, H2O. And it had a 1,020-inch photomultiplier tubes lining the surface of the cylindrical tank to detect these Cherenkov light flashes. Now, mainly sensitive, this experiment is mainly sensitive to uh, um, electron neutrinos, but it could also detect, uh, sorry, here it says mainly sensitive to high energy neutrinos produced by the boron decay. So like the Davis's experiment, this water experiment is also sensitive to the high energy neutrinos primarily. The first results were announced in 1989, some 30 years ago, and this is what they found. The number of high energy neutrinos detected was less than predicted by the standard model of the sun and by the standard model of elementary particle physics. Same as Davis 1968. But the discrepancy was less severe. Davis said I could only detect 33%. These people said I could detect 45%. So, they planned, the Japanese planned, a really big experiment. This is called the Super Kamio Kande. This is an artist's sketch. There is a mountain, and there is the experiment. These are two tunnels leading up to the experiment. Now, this experiment consists of two chambers. There is an outer volume, this volume here, 
which contains 32,000 tons of water, and there is an inner volume containing 18,000 tons of water. So the inner cylinder has 18,000 tons. The annulus between the outer cylinder and the inner cylinder has more water. And there are 11,000 photomultiplier tubes lining the cylinders to detect the Cherenkov photons. And before this tank was filled with water, right up to the top, the Japanese, being very careful, are going in a little rubber dinghy, inspecting this photomultiplier tube. So water has been filled up to that level, and water is at to that. Okay. So the tank walls, these are all the photomultiplier tubes, 11,000 high-precision photomultiplier tubes lining the walls of the cylinder. So what were the results of this Kamiokande experiment, super Kamiokande experiment? Precise measurements of the higher energy neutrinos confirm the deficit of the higher energy neutrinos found by the chlorine experiment and the earlier Kamiokande 2 experiments. Like in the Kamiokande 2 experiment, the deficit was less than in the chlorine experiment of Davis. The number of neutrino events was 45% of the predicted value. So one picture is worth 10,000 words again. That's the number of electron neutrinos that you expect to detect. Davis detected one third of them in his chlorine experiment. Kamio Kande detected 45% of the expected flux, super Kamiokande. But this could detect all flavors of neutrinos, electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and the tau neutrinos. So a naughty thought occurred in the minds of various people. Since Kamiokande could detect neutrinos of all flavors, one was left wondering. One was left wondering about whether the experiment had in fact detected the muon neutrinos and tau neutrinos also. So, here is the uh, summary of all these experiments. There was a deficit of neutrinos in all the experiments, chlorine, water, gallium, both low energy as well as high energy neutrinos were missing, although not in the same proportions. Is it simply that our prediction of the expected flux of solar neutrinos is wrong. So the question rose again. How do we know the temperature and density in this? Arns Bethe was admittedly a genius, but he had to have a value for the density and temperature at the center of the sun. Can we really be sure that we understand the model of the sun to that degree of accuracy? That question arose. So in other words, could the standard model of the sun be wrong? Not the, not, not the standard nuclear physics be wrong, but the model of the sun could be wrong. Because please remember that the nuclear reaction rates depend on the energy with which the protons collide, and there is an energy spectrum which is given by Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And that is governed by the temperature. And the probability of collision is governed by the density. So on both counts, you need to know precisely the value of the density and the temperature at the center of the sun. Can we be that sure that we got it right? So this is where the subject of helioseismology came in. And this could provide a check on the theoretical model of the distribution of the temperature and density in the interior of the sun. By 1997, Ten years after the Super Kamiokande result, the results of the helioseismology confirmed that the theoretical predictions of the sound speed inside the sun is accurate to less than 0.01%. So you remember the speed of sound is given by, governed by temperature and density. So people found out I don't have time to tell you about helioseismology, it's a very fascinating subject. The sun is oscillating, and you can Fourier analyze it into millions of normal modes, 
and then you work backwards and ask what is this telling us about the interior conditions of the sun it's a very sophisticated mathematical theory and people it, it is a very mature subject and there is every reason to believe that when they when the uh, astronomers solar astronomers say that look i know the center of the sun to an accuracy better than 0.01% so i didn't realize i did have one of those slides the sun is oscillating in many modes by studying these oscillations you can infer the density and the temperature and the sound speed etc in the sun and it's an excellent tool to verify the theoretical models of the interior of the sun okay so this helio seismology confirmed this therefore this strengthened the suspicion that something must be happening to the neutrinos as they travel to the earth from the center of the sun because you have now ruled out mistakes in your calculation of the number of neutrinos you have ruled out mistake in estimating the density and temperature in the center of the sun therefore all that remains is what ponte carvo and gribo had said something happened to the neutrinos on the way to the earth how do you tell go out and look never underestimate the experimental physicists so the japanese once again took the lead in this and they tried beauty they did a beautiful experiment with what is called atmospheric neutrinos and these atmospheric neutrinos uh, uh, in 1998 gave the first direct proof that neutrinos were in fact oscillating between different flavors how was this experiment done and how was this conclusion arrived at first what are sol what are atmospheric neutrinos this is our atmosphere the earth is over here a cosmic ray from some distant galaxy comes and in our atmosphere it produces secondary hadrons mainly pi mesons k mesons and like these pi mesons quickly decay to mu meson and a mu neutrino and an anti neutrino depending on what kind of pi meson it is then these mu mesons again decay to an electron producing electron neutrinos and mu on neutrinos and these electron neutrinos and mu on neutrinos produced in the atmosphere are called as the atmospheric neutrinos at this point i should mention for historical purposes the first detection of atmospheric neutrinos was not far from here in kolar gold field experiment done by professor m g k menon professor srikantan and their group in the 1960s when i was in chicago i remember professor m g k menon visiting the fermi institute and giving a talk on the first detection of atmospheric neutrinos there was some doubt initially but then finally everybody agreed but then that experiment was shut down sadly so we we were the pioneers in the field but uh, we lost uh, you know uh, momentum now there is a talk of building a big solar uh, neutrino observatory but that's a long time 50 years later so here we are talking of experiments done in kamio kande so what is the experiment here is the earth and here is the atmosphere the sizes are all wrong it should be much bigger than the atmosphere so the collision of cosmic rays so there is japan on the surface of the earth and there is super kamio kande detector so this is what happens somewhere up there a muon neutrino is produced in the atmosphere and that muon neutrino travels to kamio kande experiment somewhere over here on the other side of the earth a muon neutrino is produced because cosmic ray flux is isotropic coming from all directions and that muon neutrino also goes to kamio kande but it travels 13000 kilometers through the earth 
So the path length traveled by the muon neutrino, this muon neutrino is much larger than the path length traveled by this. So if the neutrinos oscillated in flavor, then you should find different number of neutrinos arriving from overhead and arriving from underneath the Earth. So this was the experiment. So the number of neutrinos detected depends upon where the neutrinos were produced. OK? These neutrinos had to travel only 10 to 100 kilometers, whereas these neutrinos had to travel 13,000 kilometers more. So if muon neutrinos oscillated in flavor, as Ponte Carvo had suggested, then because of the different distances traveled, the number of observed muon neutrinos would be different. So here are the experimental results. So what is plotted in these diagrams is the number of events as a function of the angle. This is cos theta is 1. This is cos theta is minus 1. So theta is obviously this angle. This is the Earth. Now, <clears throat> I don't want to explain the experimental conclusion using these figures. I will rather do it using this histogram. So in August 1998, uh, the experimental results were announced. And this is the, the red histogram is the expected number of neutrinos without oscillations. The green is the expected number with oscillation. The dots are the experimental result. So, so the expected number of neutrinos, if there was no such thing as neutrino oscillation, this is as a function of angle this angle over which the neutrinos are coming to Kamiokande. That is that histogram. The black dots with the error bars are the observed number of muon neutrinos. And the green histogram is the expected number with neutrino oscillation. So this was the first experimental proof that neutrinos did oscillate between various flavors. Therefore, this is the same thing as before. So Kamiokande experiment detected 45%. Uh, uh, this suggested neutrino oscillations, but the atmospheric neutrino experiment proved the neutrino oscillation. This was followed by another set of experiments called Kamland experiment. The reactors produce antineutrinos. And there are reactors uh, in Japan, China, and all over South Asia at various distances. So Kamiokande experiment tried to detect neutrinos from these. Please remember in this water detector, you can tell the direction in which the neutrinos came, right? So these Kamland experiments confirmed neutrino oscillation to an even greater uh, degree of accuracy. So next job was to actually find the smoking gun, as John Bacall said. Three different types of experiments were done. Imaginatively, we'll call them E1, E2, and E3. Experiment number one will detect only electron neutrinos. Experiment number two and three will detect all neutrinos. What do we expect? Experiment number one should detect 33% of what was predicted. What should experiment two and three detect? Three times this, because this could detect all neutrinos. So where was this experiment done? This experiment was done in a place called Sudbury Mine in Canada. And this is known as the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. It's 2,000 meters underground, and that is the experiment. The inner volume, this inner volume, is an acrylic sphere. It contains 1,000 tons of heavy water, D2O, not H2O. 
you will see why in a minute this is surrounded by an 18 meter diameter geodesic buckminster fuller sphere i think there on which are mounted 9500 photo multiplier tubes each now capable of detecting single photons and this whole assembly is suspended in a cavern this cavern here which is 22 meters wide and 34 meters high which is carved out of rock solid rock and it's filled with 7000 tons of ordinary water h2 so therefore there is d2o and there is h2o and there are photomultiplier tubes over here a very clever experiment here is the buckminster fuller dome which i referred to the acrylic sphere is inside that and these are the photomultiplier tubes capable of detecting single photons of cherenkov light all right now follow me carefully what are the three experiments you can do with this setup one of course we have already discussed in kamio kande that neutrino scatters off an electron and that electron then radiates in the forward direction cherenkov light which will illuminate some photomultiplier tubes this experiment can detect all flavors of neutrinos although it is 6. 6.5 times more efficient in detecting electron neutrinos compared to muon and tau neutrino so this is experiment number 1 experiment number 2 and 3 are brand new because you have for the first time heavy water what do you get with heavy water first of all a neutrino can break up the deuteron in d2o and the deuteron becomes a neutron proton pair and the neutrino of course is uh, it's scattered now neutrino of any pair can destroy a deuteron bound state of neutron and proton now this neutron thus released produces a gamma ray and the gamma ray scatter of a free electron and then the free electron produces cherenkov light so don't get bogged down in the detailed chemistry of it the important thing to appreciate is that in the second experiment a deuteron in the in d2o is dissociated and then in a series of reactions an electron is accelerated to relativistic speeds and it produces cherenkov light the important thing is this process can detect neutrinos of all flavors so this experiment should detect 100% of the theoretically predicted flux the third experiment is neutrino absorption in heavy water not dissociation of deuterium neutrino absorption what happens is a neutrino is absorbed by the neutron inside the deuterium and the neutron transforms itself to a proton producing an electron so an electron neutrino is absorbed by this neutron and two protons come out you are not concerned with that but it is the electron that produces cherenkov light which will illuminate your photomultiplier tubes now please appreciate that this process cannot happen in ordinary water because in ordinary water you have only h2o so you have proton and proton you don't have proton and a neutron and an electron neutrino cannot be absorbed by a proton a proton can only absorb an anti neutrino remember our reaction see if, if i bring the neutrino to this side it becomes an anti neutrino 
But the sun doesn't produce electron antineutrinos. It only produces electron neutrinos. Therefore, this particular process cannot happen in the Kamiokande experiment, but it can happen in the Sudbury experiment. Okay? Now, these are all details, but I would rather focus on something else. Now, here, for example, is an actual data. Here is the, uh, the photomultiplier tubes lit up, and the neutrino came from behind the screen, somewhere over there. Now, one of the things you have to worry about when you plan an experiment like this, or any experiment, particularly such impossibly difficult experiments, is signal-to-noise ratio. So we have to worry about background events that may produce these things. What are the background events that we are talking about? Cherenkov light is also produced by cosmic rays. You go to Uti, they have searchlight mirrors to detect the Cherenkov light, which is produced by cosmic rays which interact with nuclei in our atmosphere. Unfortunately, this Cherenkov light is much more than the Cherenkov light you expect from real neutrino events. So you have to find a way to suppress this background or account for it and remove it. So that is why the ordinary water is there in the outer cylinder. Okay? So you have to have coincidence, anti-coincidence experiment to rule out the background. But it's not as simple as this. Please remember, radio, even if you have done the radioactivity of the detector materials themselves. For example, heavy water can be radioactive. The acrylic vessel that holds the heavy water can be radioactive. The glass and steel photomultiplier tubes of the photomultiplier tubes can be radioactive. The support structures of all have traces of radioactivity. This thing is radioactive. It's just that the number of decay products it produces is so small that it doesn't uh, concern us as far as the health issues are concerned. But not if you're dealing with experiments like this. So you can't just go to your supermarket and buy steel and photomultiplier tube and heavy water. You have to be terribly careful in making sure that there is no trace of radioactivity in any... And look at the scale of the experiment. Okay? That is not all. The air in the mine is radioactive radon gas. So if you go to mines, there is a lot of radon gas. And that is radioactive as anything. All right? So the entire underground laboratory had to be operated as a giant clean room. If you go to ISRO, you'll find a clean room of this size in which the satellites are assembled. But there's no big deal to make a clean room of this size. But here, the entire experiment, all the tunnels through which the experimentalists come and so on, has to be a clean room. So it's a, it is a horrendous task. And the only reason you could believe the results of this experiment is that the experimentalists understood these things perfectly well. Okay? That's the only reason you should believe them. Hmm? What are the results? First, take the experiment in which neutrino is absorbed by the heavy water. This is possible only for the electron neutrino, because this is beta decay. And the first measurements predicted that approximately one third of the predicted neutrinos are detected. So this preliminary results confirmed Raymond Davis's 1968 results that only one third of them are electron neutrinos. Please remember that the Kamiokande and the Super Kamiokande experiment detected 45%, and that led to the, our conjecture that there could have been neutrino oscillations, and the atmospheric neutrino experiment confirmed this. So we are really interested in the results of the other two experiments now, which is why this whole thing was done. OK, are you ready? Fasten your seat belts, because this is physics. 
Okay, my teacher began every lecture of every course with the same sentence. He will stand there and say, "Physics is an experimental subject," and then he will write uh, whatever it is. But he always, for years and years and years, he did this. Okay, so. Between November 1999 and May 2001, the, the observatory detected half a billion events, half a billion events, and these experiments, experimentalists concluded, but only 3,000 of them were real candidate events. Okay? So you see how well they understood the errors in the experiment. Now, the detailed analysis gave the following sensational results. The Sudbury Neutrino Observatory detected a total of 5.09 million neutrinos per square centimeter per second. So, 5 million neutrinos. I'm not saying what species, 5 million neutrinos it detected. Of these, 1.7 million were electron neutrinos. That's one third. That means that two thirds of the total number of neutrinos detected, this is the total number, were either muon neutrinos or tau neutrinos. So here is the result stated in all its glory. The results of the experiment published in 2013, it took them a hell of a long time to analyze this data, is that the sum of the three flavors of neutrinos was 5.25 plus or minus 0 0.16 statistical error, minus 0 0.13 plus 0 0.11 systematic errors into 10 to the power 6 per square centimeter per second. So that's the result. And what is the theoretically predicted is 5.58, 1 plus or minus 0.14 into 10 to the power 6. So what the experimentalists do is to draw these various um, possible bands and see where they all intersect and so that's where your experimental result is with the highest degree of confidence and the result is the number of muon neutrinos plus tau neutrinos is 3.26 plus or minus 0.25 into this which is exactly twice the number of electron neutrinos. Thus, the extremely sensitive Sudbury Neutrino Observatory experiment with heavy water provided the definitive evidence for neutrino oscillation. The extraordinarily prescient prediction by Bruno Ponticaro in 1969 turned out to be correct. The standard model of the sun was correct. The deficit of solar neutrinos found in 1968 by Raymond Davis was real. So now let's look at the Nobel Prize history. Neutrinos were predicted by Pauli in 1930. They were eventually discovered in 1956 by Rhinus and Cowan. They detected anti-neutrinos produced in nuclear reactors. But, you know, that was the time, I remember, when every year the Nobel Prize went to somebody or his grandmother who found a new elementary particle. But they did not give a Nobel Prize for the discovery of the neutrino, which is such a fundamental elementary particle. And by the time the guys in Stockholm woke up in 1995, Clyde Cowan was no more. And uh, only Frederick Reines went to Stockholm to collect the prize. This is a terrible tragedy. Uh, there are some incredible aberrations like this, Nobel Prizes. 
So finally, anyway, the discovery of the neutrino was awarded the Nobel Prize not long ago, just 20 years ago. Then in 2002, Raymond Davis was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics for the chlorine experiment and for the first detection of solar neutrinos. And Koshiba was awarded the Nobel Prize for the detection of the neutrinos from the supernova of 23rd February 1987 using the Kamio, Super Kamiokande uh, uh, detector. And then, a year and a half ago, the Nobel Prize was awarded to uh, Kajita for the atmospheric neutrino experiment in Kamiokande in 1998 and to Arthur MacDonald for the Sudbury neutrino experiment and the citation read for the discovery of neutrino oscillations, which shows that neutrinos have mass. So now I want to discuss very briefly what is the physics of neutrino oscillation and what is the moral of the story. Neutrinos are created with specific flavor, as they are called. Electron neutrino, muon neutrino, or tau neutrino. The important thing to appreciate is that these flavor states are not eigenstates with a definite mass. Okay? So in quantum mechanics, what you do is you consider such states as a linear combination of the more basic eigenstates, in this case, the mass eigenstates. Or, you are not familiar with the concept of eigenstate, then you, you will, when you study quantum mechanics, you will come to that. The, the, the point is, in quantum mechanics, you give a wave description to various energy levels, and whenever you do that, there are many ways. It will become clear to you in a, in a little while. Just uh, I'm giving an example of that. It will become clear to you in a little while. For example, we, you are familiar with the concept of light, right circularly polarized and left circularly polarized light. And you know very well that these are linear combinations of linearly polarized radiation in orthogonal directions. In other words, circular motion is a linear combination of two harmonic oscillators perpendicular to one another, or you can, it, it depends on which you consider more fundamental, right? So, if you have studied some quantum mechanics, a couple of equations I'm going to write will make sense. Otherwise, go by the analogy with right circular and left circular polarized radiation. And I will also try to show you a little movie lasting a minute or so. These flavor states, electron, muon, tau, neutrinos, are indicated by nu alpha, alpha, beta, gamma, are the three flavor eigenstates. But the more basic quantities are nu, i, j, k, which are the mass eigenstates. And the statement is that the flavor states are a linear combination of the mass eigenstates. Or if you think the mass eigenstates are less fundamental, the fundamental things are the flavor eigenstates, then the mass eigenstates are a linear combination of the flavor states, whichever way you like. What is the transformation? What about these matrices which combine these waves? These are familiar. I'm considering only two flavors here because I can write simple equations. Imagine there are only two flavors of neutrinos and not three. This is the familiar rotation matrix in two dimension, cos theta, sine theta, minus theta, theta, cos theta. And this theta is known as the mixing angle. This is the angle with, with which you mix. So to get circular motion, I have two harmonic oscillators at 90 degrees. So the mixing angle is 90 degrees. If it is not 90 degrees, I want to circle, I'll get an ellipse. Okay, so, that, so the theory of elementary particle physics tells you what the value of this angle, mixing angle is. I've got two cream eggs making two pendulum. 
Two pendula. I should. I, uh... Come on. <laughs> this is about coupled pendulums. This is a bit of string, and from the bit of string, I've dangled two pendulum going through a cream egg with a little button on the bottom to make sure that it doesn't slip off. Now then, if I bang one of these pendulum forwards like this, it will eventually stop again. Look, I bang it like that, and at a later time it's stationary. And at a later time it is stationary. It's magic. And I remember a magician showing this on a television show where he put a handkerchief in front and said, now it's stationary. And it would be. And then he'd open this one up and say, now this is stationary. And it would be. This is magic. Only it's simple laws of physics at work. We call these coupled oscillators. The reason is, this is one oscillator and that's another one. But they're coupled in a funny way through the string at the top. And there are little forces, as this goes out of line, that pull from one to the other, transferring energy from this one, which is now coming to a rest here, over to that one, and then back again. Have fun for Easter, and remember, use hygienic needles if you're going to eat the eggs afterwards. <laughs> yeah. So, let's look at another example. Here are two linearly polarized radiation, vertically polarized and horizontally polarized. If the phase angle between them is such, as shown in the left figure, then I'll get right circularly polarized light. By that I mean as this oscillates back and forth, and as this oscillates back and forth, the tip of this arrow will move in a clockwise direction. But if the phase is like this, it'll move in an anti-clockwise direction. Therefore, circular polarization is a superposition of two orthogonal linear polarization. The relative phases between H and V determines whether it is left or right circular polarized radiation. And if the relative phase changes with time, then left will become right and will become left again, will become right again, and so on. Right? So there is an oscillation between left circular and right circular polarization. All right, now let's go get back to the um, uh, flavor states and mass states. The mass eigenstates are normal modes of the system, and their propagation can be described by plane waves, e to the power minus i e t minus p x, plane wave solutions of this form. And this equation tells you how it evolves in time, e to the power minus e over t, e i t, where e i is the energy of the state with mass equal to i. So there are two mass states, m1 and m2. So this is a propagating wave, this is a propagating wave, and they propagate with the same velocity if the mass m1 is equal to mass m2. Now the statement is that a propagating flavor state, our electron, neutrino, muon, neutrino, tau neutrino, is a linear combination of these two propagating mass states. Now, if the masses of particle one and two are the same, the phase difference between these two will not change with time, and therefore the superposition of this will not change with time. So a particular flavor state will remain that particular flavor state. But if the neutrino eigenstates M1 and M2 have non-zero masses and the masses are different, then these two will propagate with different speeds. And therefore, the phase difference between the mass eigenstates will change with time. And therefore, the linear superposition, which is a flavor state, will oscillate between one flavor and another flavor. For example, 
I have two mass eigenstates, which are blue and red. And let us say they have different masses, therefore they're propagating with different velocities. And let us say when they are in phase, I call it an electron neutrino. When they are exactly out of 100 degree, 180 degrees out of phase, I call it either a muon neutrino or tau neutrino. You see, during propagation, what happens is the electron neutrino becomes a muon neutrino, becomes an electron neutrino again, a muon neutrino, and this is the oscillation of the flavor state during propagation. So this is the phenomenon of neutrino oscillation. Now, if mu, if nu e of t is this, it's a linear combination of mass eigenstate one and two. Look at this. So this is the cos theta sine theta minus sine theta cos theta matrix. That is where this cos theta sine theta come. Therefore, the amplitude the electron neutrino will remain an electron neutrino after a time t is given by this integral. And the probability that an electron neutrino remaining as an electron neutrino is the square of this amplitude, which is 1 minus sine squared 2 theta minus sine squared of this factor. So if I plot this, what I will find is the probability that an electron neutrino will remain as an electron neutrino will go from 1 to 0 to 1 to 0, it will oscillate. And similarly for the muon neutrino. So this is the phenomenon of neutrino oscillation illustrated for the case when there are two flavors for the simplicity. So this I already said, if the relative phase between H and V, which determines whether it is right circular or left circular, if the relative phase changes periodically, then the helicity will change periodically between right and left. So the neutrinos were produced in the sun as electron neutrinos. As they traveled to the earth, their flavor oscillated between muon neutrino, tau neutrino, and electron neutrino. So when they arrived at the Earth, there was an admixture of neutrinos of all three flavors. And of course, the mystery is solved. Davis's experiment could only detect electron neutrinos. And whereas the Sudbury heavy water experiment could detect all neutrinos, and it found the remaining two thirds of the neutrino. So what is the moral of all this? It was an extraordinary story that began in the beginning of 1960s. Well, finding the neutrino itself was a great achievement. And it ended in around 2011. It took a long time. The fundamental thing to appreciate is that in order for this neutrino oscillation to happen, the neutrinos must have non-zero mass. And of, ever since Pauli and Fermi, we have always believed neutrinos had zero mass. In fact, Abdus Salam was one of the authors of the Salam Weinberg Glashow unification of electromagnetic forces with weak forces. The way he discovered this weak unification is a question his teacher Rudolf Piles asked him. He said, Abdus, tell me, why does a neutrino have zero mass? And it is that pursuit that led Salam to his great discovery. But now we are finding that the neutrinos don't have zero mass. Okay. What does the present data imply? That the mass of the electron neutrino is about 100 million times smaller than the mass of the electron but it is non-zero. The, the last word has not been said on these things. These experiments are going on to actually determine the masses. At present, people think that the mass of one of the neutrinos, electron neutrino, is about 100 mil, 10 to the power 8 times half an MeV. But it's non-zero. Now, 
A non-zero mass requires a major revision of the standard model of elementary particle physics because according to the standard model of elementary particle physics, the neutrinos must have zero mass. Therefore, we started asking why the sun shines. In August 1920, nearly 100 years ago, Eddington answered it. It took us nearly a century to prove that Eddington was right. But in the process, we have discovered that fundamental physics needs a major revision. But this is not new. This is not the first time it has happened. Astronomy has played a major role in the growth of physics. Please remember. The laws of gravitation were discovered in the context of astronomy. The finiteness of velocity of light, Roman's experiment. Spectroscopy, the discovery of helium in the sun, the first verification of time dilatation, new mesons reaching the surface of the Earth, the first proof of gravitational radiation, are some examples from the past of fundamental revolutions in physics that occurred through astronomy. We find that once again, a major input into physics, namely that the standard model of physics needs a major revision, has come from astronomy. So I would like to end on that note and ask if there are any questions. Yes, please. I think you have to pass. Where was? Here, in the back row, over there. Yes? No, no, there's a switch there, turn it on. Oscillations, like uh, neutrino, neutrino oscillations, does it happen in any other cases, like, or only two neutrinos, like these oscillations? It, it was first discovered <coughs> in the context of K-mesons. Um, there are some K-mesons which decay to two pi mesons. There are other k-mesons decay to three pi mesons. When I was an MSc uh, student, this was the great puzzle in physics. Why it decays to two pi mesons and three pi mesons? So that was discovered because of an oscillation. And it is that oscillation that gave Bruno Pontecorvo the idea right at that time that maybe neutrinos would also be oscillating. Okay. So these are the two examples that I know, uh, oscillations of the k meson states. And the, uh, the, those are the only two things that I know of. Yes? Sir, in the case of uh, the Kamiokande experiment, yes. uh, how, why was it like it was less sensitive to other two neutrinos and more sensitive to electron neutrinos? That has to do with this electroweak theory and, uh, with which you calculate the scattering cross-section of the neutrino-electron scattering. So you have to go into the physics of neutrino-electron scattering, and that scattering cross-section is different for electron-neutrino, muon-neutrino, and tau-neutrino. I'm not very knowledgeable about this, but that's where the difference has to come. So it comes uh, because of the theory, and so if, if it was like 45% were reported, so they could have like ended the story there by just telling that we calculated it. Well, you, you could have, but you'd never be sure, right? So, so that's why the Sudbury experiment was done. Yeah, in a sense, after the atmospheric neutrino experiment, you could have said more boldly, yeah, problem is solved. You're, you're right. But, but then this, as Bakal said, there's nothing like finding the smoking gun, right? And that's what this experiment was all about. Hello. Sir, it seems wait, like... Put up your hands. Ah, yes, I can see Sir, you. It now. seems like, like it's depend on time lapse between the sun to earth. Yeah, oscillation probability like 1 by 3, 1 by 3, 1 by 3. Because the time can be like all the neutrinos are in the electron neutrino mode or... Yes, I have not gone into questions like that in this lecture. You are absolutely right. The wavelength of oscillation, which is really what you are talking about, depends on the energy, okay, energy of the neutrinos. 
And uh, it so happens that that wavelength is small compared to the distance between the sun and the earth. But you are absolutely right. In principle, if the wavelength was much larger than the earth-sun distance, there would have been no oscillation. The other thing, again, Hans Bethe made a very important contribution to this when he was 90 years old, he was still doing very fundamental things, is that the neutrino has to come from the center of the sun to the surface. There it is really going through matter. So in matter, there are also resonant reaction that takes place. It's called MSW effect, okay, named after the three people who studied this. So there are some resonant reactions that take place, which vastly reduces the, this wavelength. I've not uh, gone into this, but uh, if you go to Macau's paper, this will all be explained. But it was Hans Bethe who pointed out that uh, a lot of this oscillation would have happened inside the sun itself. After that, it's traveling in vacuum. Okay? Yeah, it's a very good question you ask. Yes. Yes, here is a... Uh, uh, sir, in the uh, last slides, you showed that means the flavor is dependent on the mass. This mass has been showed as a wave. So, means how can mass just change? Like no, 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 no. Mass is not changing with time. You, you see, you, you, you see, in quantum physics, we describe. Uh, Take Schrodinger equation. You solve Schrodinger equation. What do you get? You get a wave solution, right? Yes. So that is what we are talking about here. The propagation of that is a wave. E to the power minus I E T minus momentum times the x coordinate or k dot r if you are talking three dimensional wave tells you how this wave evolves with time, and that evolution depends upon the energy and the momentum. So it's not that the mass is not oscillating. What we are saying is, so if you want to say, say mass one state is like vertical polarization. Mass two state is like horizontal polarization. The flavor states are like right circular and left circular polarization. Okay. So the mass is not changing with time. The amplitude of this is changing. The square of the amplitude is the probability of the intensity. Is that clear? You think about it a little bit, or maybe next time we could discuss some more during coffee break. Yes? How could Davis count individual argon atoms? Yes. I don't remember now exactly what is the chemical process by which he separates them. Yes. Yes. He, you, you extract it. You don't go counting it in the tank. You extract these argon atoms from the tank. I'm sorry, I don't remember, or maybe I never knew exactly what is the chemistry with which he extracts these atoms. Whatever it is, it's an incredible achievement, right? <laughs> Any further questions? Okay, if not, let me tell you where we are heading next week. So we are done with the sun and the stars, which are gaseous blobs. But now we have to discuss condensed stars, stars which are only as big as the Earth and not million kilometers as the sun in radius. So if you compress the sun from million kilometer radius to 10,000 kilometers, the density will become a million grams per cubic centimeter. And then if I compress that to the size of Bangalore, 10 kilometers, its density will become 10 to the power 14 grams per cubic centimeter. So at a density of million grams per cubic centimeter, let alone 10 to the power 14 grams per cubic centimeter, Boyle's law surely cannot be correct. So we have to discuss stars in the context of quantum physics. So that will take us to a discussion of white dwarfs and neutron stars, and the great discovery made by Chandrasekhar in 1930, and its consequences to contemporary astronomy.
So that's where ne next week we'll be discussing white dwarfs and neutron stars. Okay. Thank you.